Once again, we have set aside the second Sunday of May to honor our mothers. As one resource puts it, godly mothers are the nation's greatest resource, the Lord's best helpers, and the most blessed among women. Abraham Lincoln was right. No one is poor who has a godly mother. Chuck Swindoll adds, there is no more influential or powerful role on earth than a mother's. As significant as political, military, educational, or religious figures may be, none can compare to the impact made by mothers. Their words are never fully forgotten. Their touch leaves an indelible impression, and the memory of their presence lasts a lifetime. To all of these statements, I give a hearty amen. Mothers are certainly worthy of our adoration and appreciation. Here's the thing. We don't worship mothers. We worship God. We thank God for our mothers, but the focus of our worship must be on the Almighty. And so how does Mother's Day fit into that? Well, I believe that Mother's Day, as well as Father's Day, which will be celebrated next month, remind us of the motherhood and the fatherhood of God. You say, motherhood? Yeah, the motherhood of God. Now, before you think I've lost my evangelical mind, I am not suggesting that God is female, that we should pray to our heavenly mother, nor am I suggesting that uh, the Bible is a sexist book, that Christianity is sexist. And I am not in favor of the gender-inclusive versions of the Bible that seek to remove all masculine references to God. I don't believe in any of that. But I do believe that a complete view of who God is cannot only be subjected to the masculine descriptions of God. God is neither masculine nor feminine, but I do believe that you see the best traits of both motherhood and fatherhood in God. In God you find the pattern and the power of motherhood as he intends. Let's not forget what the Bible says in Genesis 1, verses 26 and 27. Then God said, let us make man in our image, in our likeness, and let them rule over the fish of the sea and the birds of the air, over the livestock, over the earth, and over the creatures that move along the ground. So God created man in his image. In the image of God, he created them. Male and female, he created them. Now, again, I'm not saying that God is masculine or feminine, but it is clear that both men and women were created in the image of God. And if we turn that around, you see God's image in both men and women, in both fathers and mothers. God himself is a spirit. Jesus said this in John 4.24, God is spirit. Those who worship him must worship him in spirit and in truth. Uh, We should not think of God as just a greater human. He is distinct from us. He is infinitely greater than we are. But it is important to see that both men and women were created in the image of God. We both reflect his likeness. And so we see God not only in our fathers, but in our mothers as well. The adjectives that we use of God in the Bible are not intended to indicate sexuality, but generic personhood. God is neither male nor female, but he is both. He he contains all personhood. We are made in his image, male and female. The Bible is clear that God is the ground of all masculinity and femininity. Even while transcending these distinctions, God also encompasses them. The God of the Bible is neither the man upstairs nor Mother Nature. 
He is neither the sky father nor the earth mother. And yet, analogies of gender are used to describe God in the Bible both as a father and as a mother. The concept of the motherhood of God is not, like you may think, the product of the modern feminist movement. Over a century ago, the celebrated preacher and author G. Campbell Morgan wrote concerning the creation of Adam and Eve, In the man and the woman, and not in either alone, the image and likeness of God are seen. God created man in his own image. In the image of God, he created them. Male and female, he created them. In God are both fatherhood and motherhood. Elsewhere he wrote, In God, fatherhood and motherhood merge. And we will never grasp the fullest fact concerning God until we recognize this double truth. Now this does not imply that God is a woman. Again, God is a spirit. He doesn't have a physical body. He is genderless. When we speak of the Father, we're speaking of his office, of his activity, not to gender. Now it is true, Jesus was conceived and born male. He was a man. And I believe that is because, as we read in the letter to the Romans, he was the last Adam. Uh, We cannot dispute the fact that the first created human being was male. And Paul writes in Romans that in Adam we all sin, in Christ we are all made alive. So yes, Jesus, when he was incarnated into human flesh, he was a man. But that does not suggest that God as a whole is a man. Like the Father, the Holy Spirit has neither gender, but he indwells both male and female believers. And it is important to understand there is an aspect of the motherhood of God that we often neglect, but we shouldn't. I think we can learn a great deal from that. Now, we are still in our series of messages, Unchanging Truth and Uncertain Times. So far, we have seen the unchanging person of God. He does not change in his basic characteristics and attributes. We have seen the unchanging precepts of God. The the laws, the rules, the commands that he has given. They do not change. They do not go away. In our last message, we saw the unchanging promises of God. And how we can properly understand them and apply them to our lives today. This morning, I'd like to consider the unchanging passion of God The love of God toward us, his creation, is as immutable, as unchanging as his very character. We are told in several passages of scripture, God is love. That is a basic component of who he is. And that never changes. The love of God is as great today as it was when God first created the universe, first created humanity... And it will never change. Through other texts we see the similarity of God's love to a mother's love. And in the end we're going to see the superiority of God's love to mothers. As precious as a mother's love is to us, in God we find something greater than a mother's love. So we begin with the similarity of God's love to mothers. Throughout scripture, we read of the love of God. In the very last book of the Old Testament, Malachi chapter 1, verse 2, God says, I have loved you, says the Lord. Now you pair that with the verse we've looked at previously from Malachi, Malachi 3, 6, I the Lord do not change. Therefore, you descendants of Jacob are not destroyed. You can see how combining the unchanging nature of God with his love shows that his love does not change. God is unshifting in his love. Another passage we looked at previously in this series, Lamentations 3.22. Because of the Lord's great love, we are not consumed. His compassions never fail. Here again, his love will never fail. His love will never cease. 
His love will never change. Both Malachi and Jeremiah arrive at the same conclusion regarding God's love. If it weren't for God's love, we wouldn't be around. We may say that about our mothers. I mean, it's true. If it weren't for our mothers, none of us would be here. But how much more this is true of God's love for us. Also, like a mother, God is unsparing in his comfort. In Isaiah 66, 13, God says, As a mother comforts her child, so I will comfort you, and you will be comforted over Jerusalem. Children who are sick or injured or afraid or brokenhearted usually call on their mothers, even though they know that their father loves and cares for them, because a mother's comfort is very special. It is just something that cannot be substituted for. We want our mother in those times. Earlier in Isaiah 49, 13, we read, Shout for joy, O heavens. Rejoice, O earth. Burst into song, O mountains. Why? For the Lord comforts his people and will have compassion on his afflicted ones. God comforts us in his love. Psalm 119 verse 76 says, May your unfailing love be my comfort according to your promises to your servant. Notice the connection between God's unfailing love and the comfort that it brings. God is unsparing in his comfort. We see this in the New Testament. In 2 Corinthians 1, beginning in verse 3, we read, Praise be to the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, the Father of compassion and the God of all comfort, who comforts us in all our troubles so that we can comfort others who are in any trouble with the same comfort we ourselves have received from God. Just as the sufferings of Christ flow over into our lives, so also through Christ our comfort overflows. If we are distressed, it is for your comfort and salvation. If we are comforted, it is for your comfort, which produces in you patient endurance of the same sufferings we suffer. And our hope for you is firm because we know that just as you share in our sufferings, you also share in our comfort. The God of all comfort, who comforts us in all of our troubles so that we can comfort others in any trouble they may be going through. God wants us to not only receive his comfort, but to reflect that to others. He is the God of all comfort. The Lord comforts as a mother comforts. And then third, God is unstopping in his joy. Zephaniah 3.17 reveals, The Lord God is with you. He is mighty to save. He takes great delight in you. He will quiet you with his love. He will rejoice over you with singing. Just stop for a moment and think about that. God sings over you. I can picture a mother with her her small baby in her arms, gently singing to that child, maybe uh, helping it to go to sleep, or, or just an expression of love. And God does that for us. You never knew that Scripture says that God sings. <laughs> he sings over us. We have nothing to fear in his loving arms. So we see in these ways the similarity of God's love to mothers. But we also see that there's more. (laughs) Kind of sounds like the annoying pitch man on television, doesn't it? Oh, but there's more. God's love is not only similar to a mother's love, it is superior to the love of a mother that she has for a child. Turn to Psalm 27, verse 10. The NIV reads, though my father and mother forsake me, the Lord will receive me. But I really like the way the New Living Translation 
renders this. I think it captures a bit more of the feeling of it. Even if my father and mother abandon me, the Lord will hold me close. The original term there means to leave, to abandon, to desert. It's the same term used in Psalm 22.1, which later Jesus would quote, while hanging on the cross, my God, my God, why have you forsaken me? Same word. Even if my father and my mother would abandon me, the Lord is there to hold me close. Now, most likely, when David wrote these words, it was hypothetical. There's no indication anywhere in the Old Testament that he was abandoned by his parents. Uh, Some think that perhaps he felt this way when his parents died. And it is true that sometimes uh, when a child loses a father or a mother or both, they feel abandoned. Uh, They feel like they've been left behind, even though it may not have been intentional. So perhaps that's what David was feeling. At any rate, a father and a mother might possibly forsake a child. But it is not that likely. You don't hear about it often, but it does happen. But God is a devoted and faithful father. In Psalm 103, verse 13, it reads, As a father has compassion on his children, so the Lord has compassion on those who fear him. He tenderly deals with us as would a loving mother. Isaiah 49, 15 uh, says that, Can a mother forget the baby at her breast and have no compassion on the child she is born? She may forget but I will not forget you. That's a great promise that we have. God will never forget us, never forsake us. When Isaiah searched for an illustration of God's constant love for his people, the best example he could find was a mother and her baby. And that seems to be the strongest bond on earth. Proverbial, proverbially, the mother's love is the strongest you'll ever find. Most mothers continue to love their children regardless of what they do. But it is unfortunately true that you do find some mothers that do forget. You'll hear on the news about babies that have been abandoned. Children that have been abused, even killed under the neglectful watch of their mother. It breaks our hearts, not to mention the millions of babies that are murdered every year by abortion. It's unthinkable that a mother could treat her own child in that way. But unfortunately, it does happen. And when we hear about it on the evening news, it breaks our hearts. Isn't it good to know that even as rare as that is among human mothers, it will never happen with God. She may forget, she may abandon, she may abuse, she may kill, but God never will. God will never leave us. He will never forsake us. That's one of the unchanging promises we can stand on. God's love for us is even greater than a mother's love. God will never forget. His attachment is more than a mother's. Earthly love, as wonderful as it is, may cease, but his love has no limits whatsoever. So what does this mean to us? Well, I'd like to look at one last passage uh, this morning. Psalm 131 Verses 1 and 2. Psalm 131 is a very brief psalm. It's easy to skip over as we go through the scriptures. But I believe it really speaks to this matter this morning. 
The psalmist writes, My heart is not proud, O Lord. My eyes are not haughty. I do not concern with great matters or things too wonderful for me. But I have stilled and quieted my soul like a weaned child with its mother. Like a weaned child is my soul within me. This is a beautiful picture, not only of of our own faith, but of what we can call the motherhood of God. Notice how the psalmist responds to the Lord's motherly love. First, he is humble. My eyes are not proud. My eyes are not haughty. In the arms of God, we do not need to impress anyone. We can be ourselves in the presence of our Heavenly Father. We know that God loves us, warts and all. We can be ourselves in his presence. Secondly, he is honest. I do not concern myself with great matters or things too wonderful for me. You know, we sing of God's majesty and power, his wisdom and his knowledge, and then we try to live our own lives by our own strength and skill. As A.W. Tozer used to say, Christians don't tell lies, they sing them on Sunday morning in church. We make a lie of our faith when we fail to trust God in the day-to-day details of our existence. If we truly believed in God's love and wisdom and might, we quit worrying. When we worry and fret and fuss and try to figure things out on our own, we are telling God, I don't trust you. I don't believe you can get me through this. i got to do this on my own. But if we are honest in our faith and honest in what we sing and put it into practice, we're not going to worry. We're not going to fret. We can be honest with God and say, I do trust you. I've put my faith in you, not only to receive me in eternity, but to get me through today. To help me through the situation that I'm in right now. And then finally, he is hushed. I have stilled and quieted my soul. Sounds a lot like the words of Psalm 4610. Be still and know that I am God. But that's tough to do, isn't it? (laughs) I don't know about you. I have a hard time sometimes doing that. That verse from Psalms 46, it makes... For great signs and trinkets, but again, how much do we actually do it? Peace comes when we trust in God. When we trust in his unchanging person, his unchanging promises, his unchanging passion for us. When God wanted to communicate his love to his people, he often used the example of a mother. Surely there's no greater love on earth than a mother and her child. Sorry, men, we just don't quite measure up on that scale. This is one area where women, as a whole, outdo us guys. We ought to be very thankful for our mothers on this Mother's Day, especially for those godly mothers who brought us up to know the Lord. No matter how old we are or how old they are, We will never outlive our responsibility to love and to honor them. Now, I realize that not everybody hearing these words had the experience of a loving mother in their lives. Some of you may have been abused. Some of you may have been abandoned. Some of you may feel abandoned because your mother has gone on to eternity before you. Those words may bring anguish instead of comfort, and for that I apologize. My message to you and to all of us is that there is a love greater than a mother's love. In the words of that classic hymn, the love of God is greater far than tongue or pen can ever tell. It goes beyond the highest star and reaches to the lowest hell. Could we with ink the ocean fill, and were the skies of parchment made, 
Were every stock on earth a quill, and every man a scribe by trade. To write the love of God above would drain the ocean dry, nor could the scroll contain the whole, though stretched from sky to sky. Mothers, we honor you this day. We love you. We thank you for your love, for your acts of compassion and mercy and kindness, far beyond what we deserve. But we worship our Lord, who has a greater love than a mother's love, a love that will never cease, never waver, a love that never changes. We may change. We may turn out for the worse. God still loves us. We cannot outlove our Lord, and we cannot run away from His love. His love is always there. Maybe this morning you're feeling particularly unloved. Again, Perhaps you don't have a good or godly mother to look up to. Maybe your mother has been gone for many years and you feel that absence, especially on today. I would suggest to you, open your heart, open your arms to the love of Almighty God, a love that does not change, a love that will not end, a love that will see you through the most uncertain of times. Will you bow with me in prayer? Our Heavenly Father, we thank you that in you we find a gr something greater than a mother's love, your love. Your love which you have shown to us literally every day of our lives. A love that sustains us. A love that forgives us. A love that guides us and sees us through. I pray your special blessing on all mothers today. And may we express our gratitude and our love to all of our mothers. I pray that they would feel your love in a very special way this day. And may we always appreciate and receive your love. And may we reflect that love to others that they might know how great is your love. It's in Christ's name that we pray.